Good morning to you. Um, uh, for a, here primarily I am talking about um, a fighter aircraft and more than a fighter aircraft I am talking about why it is so important to have an aircraft as a fighting machine. It is very important we should know and uh, what is it that makes an aircraft such a dominant figure in the wars, okay, that is the thing. So let me start uh, with my first slide with war and technology, okay. Whether we like it or not, if we have to protect ourselves, protect the country, protect your borders, you should be prepared for war so that you do not have a war, okay. If you are not prepared, there will be enough fellows to attack you, but they know you are powerful you are strong, they won't attack you. So you will have a peaceful life. So to want, you want to have peace, you must be strong. In ability to conduct a war, you must be there, okay. Now what is it that shaped the war? It is technology. Basically it is technology which has done that. <clears throat> they have been always linked together, war and technology. Let us say for a while there was no technology there would have been no war at all because maximum he would have done is he would have lifted a stone and thrown on the other fellow. Because there is no technology other than lifting the stone nothing else would have been there. So technology is the one which has really shaped the war. <coughs> See the weapons have always helped to determine the tactics, tactics of war, how you want to fight war, how you want to do that. And tactics in turn help determine organization, operation, logistics, commands and control systems. The quest for technological superiority is eternal. In fact, the country which is supreme in technology, it has two other things. It is also a rich country. <laughs> and also that is the country which has superior fighting capability. So you are afraid of reaching them because you know he is as technology. So it is the technology which strengthen you, you enhance your uh, what you call uh, offensive and defensive capability, security and your wealth generation, okay. That is the kind of thing. So new weapons such as artillery, ships, tanks, submarines and aircraft have changed the course of war. Now among these things, the front ranking weapon system, aircraft had the biggest impact and the military operations and the outcome of the war. Now, the whole world it is acknowledged that all military and strategic th thinkers and planners that war is not winnable unless one has air superiority. Okay, we will talk about air superiority a little later, but if you have no capability in air war, weapon, air war, weapon, there is no way you can win the war, okay. That is the, that is the thing. Now, there are different grades of this air power. The first <clears throat> if you see this, the actually aircrafts were used as a weapons only second world war. First world war they were using more like a reconnaissance going round and all that kind of thing. But second world war it is a major, if you go through some old war <laughs> movies and all that you can see it has played massive role, okay. But after the second world war, air became the dominant force. In second world war he was supporting the army, navy and every fellow. But after the second world war it is there. You can I just give some examples here. For, um, in the post second war the role of air increased by leaps and bounds. Now across the world over by all, uh, this is what I mentioned, no nation enjoying air superiority ever lost a war by force of enemy arms. Just not. So that is the crucial role it has. Now what is the first topmost grade? They call it as air supremacy. It is a position in war where one side holds complete control of air warfare, air power or opposing forces. It is defined as the degree of air superiority wherein the opposing air force is incapable of effective what you call interference. It just cannot do anything. I will give you a few examples to drill down that point, okay. 
then a superiority is the next level where a side is more forward position than the opponent. It defined as what you call the degree of dominance in air bag that permits the conduct of operation by one side and the related land, sea and air forces and given time and place without prohibitive interference by opposing forces. The first one is absolutely supreme. Here he has a dom dominant position. Okay, as a dumb. Air parity is the lowest level where a side holds control of skies above friendly. You are able to control your own territory. You are able to, but you are not able to control the enemy's territory. That is the basic point. This is called parity. He is taking care of his troops, you are taking care of your people. This is the kind of what you call parity. Air superiority is you not only are what, protecting your troops, you are also able to get, um, penetrate into the opponent's area and the controlling that portion. Supremacy is that fellow is down. Okay? That is the kind of it is important you understand this point. Now if you see the Gulf War of 1991, the uh, coalition force led by USA, they decimate Iraq by using only air power. The total operation they last only two soldiers, that is all. But afterwards, once they entered into the Iraq, they last thousand fellows. But during the they only last two fellows. Okay. Then Kosovo campaign again uh, there. Uh, the US again won the war. Afghan war, you know what is happening. Let us uh, back home. There were um, if Kargil war. What happened? The opponent was uh, on the top of a hill. The army was sitting. Our fellows were trying to warp, and they just couldn't. There was a stalemate for months. Then a uh, fighter aircraft with precision guided, precision weapons went and hit the area. Then the whole place was destroyed. Then it was only a question of one day where the Indian army could take over. Until they used this uh, fighter aircraft with precision weapons, India was at a great disadvantage. They just could not do anything. That changed the total, what you call, face of the war. I want you, I do not know how many of you are uh, there. 1971, there was a, a war where India fought with our friend, or the Pakistan. There is East Pakistan and West Pakistan, okay? And the East Pakistan, today now it is called the Bangladesh. In matter of maybe two days, the complete uh, air power and the surface to air missile, Akarta, everything was destroyed. They had nothing, okay? So our uh, 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 Air Force was taking transport aircraft with bombs and dumping bombs on them. Even transport aircraft because there is nothing to oppose them. There is nothing to surface as weapons which you can destroy. There are no aircraft which are. That is what you call as air supremacy. But when it came to western side, okay, I, I would say but nobody will um, admit it. It is more like air parity. I think we were all holding operation. They were able to, and we might have shot some aircraft, they must have shot some of our aircraft, but more or less in the same condition. Okay. 1965, the previous war, okay, it was a more like parity there. In 1962, the war we fought with China never used any air power. So, you know what happened. If you read the history, what you will see that. So, you can see the gradually what happened to India. So, as now you can see that the role of air power, even in our own context, is increasing by leaps and bounds. Okay. <clears throat> now, let us say before I say what this air power is, there are different types of aircraft which are used in this air power. Number one, what you call is an attack aircraft. This attack aircraft uh, or strike aircraft is a class of designed to attack targets on ground and sea. Primary difference between bombers is their low service ceiling and greater accuracy. An attack can do a pinpointed accuracy. If there is one small tank, it can attack and destroy it. Or a fuel dump is there, it can do so much accuracy. But bombers normally, they will dump huge number of bombs, okay? So wide area damage, but accuracy wise, this fellow is better. They, <coughs> their roles are closer support for ground operation, tactical air interdiction. Closer support means your army is now, your border is there, your army is trying to go to the other side. Your fighters are what you call escorting them and supporting them to prevent the enemy to what you call attack you. Okay? That is what they do. That is called close air support. Close air support to the army operations. Interdiction is, it go a little further, you prevent the adversary 
supplying what you call ammunition, fuel, food and all to the army which is in the front end. Suppose you prevent, interdict or stop that supply, that fellow can do nothing because he will lose his ability to fight a war. That is called interdiction, okay? This is one. <coughs> they use weapons like laser guided munition, rockets, anti tank. Closer support will be more suitable with helicopters? Also, uh, actually not necessary. For example, the Americans use uh, helicopters more often, a uh, lot of helicopters are used, but rest of the countries you see, they use more what you call attack aircraft, I mean, closure support aircraft. Even the Americans have an aircraft called A-10, okay? And they are, uh, they, um, what you call the Russians have a Su-25. Americans use helicopters in a big way, but helicopter is a, um, a slow machine. While it can do, it has certain capability, vertical takeoff, landing, observation and all that, but it has that inherent limitation, okay? So, it's a tactics what we do. The second is called a bomber. Just now I talked to you on the bombers, uh, very area bombing, huge bomb, no, go deep penetration. Today we use bombers to go deep into the enemy territory and then bomb them. So, why, where, why do you want to go deep into the territory? Normally, the critical supplies, critical ammunition, critical are very critical you are a, a, what you call aircraft, they are all far away from the battle front, okay? And uh, so, if you can damage them or destroy them, not damage, destroy them, then they lose their ability to fight a war. So, the bomber is used to go deep into it and that is how you have the old B-52 is a very famous bomber, B-1B is also a famous bomber. F-114-11 is also a bomber, B-2 is also a bomber, and the Russians have Tu-160. Indians used to have a bomber called Canberra. It's a very old one. We no longer have any bombers. We have only what you call uh, fighters. We no longer have. Many countries in the world, uh, apart from the Russians and Americans, they don't have any bombers now. Okay. <clears throat> then you see fighter, what we are talking <coughs> today. My talk will be. Are the class of aircraft designed for air to air combat with other aircraft in an offensive or defensive role? Either you go into enemy territory to attack, or if an enemy is coming to prevent him to succeed, you fight with him. They are light, agile, fast, and highly maneuverable. They also have secondary ground attack capabilities. Fighter aircraft capable of carrying missiles, rockets, and cannons, guns. Okay. <clears throat> they are categorized three types, air superiority fighters, interceptors, and fighter bombers. And uh, the famous uh, Su-30MK, which India has from Russians, you have a Eurofighter Typhoon, Lockheed Martin F-22, and uh, interceptor aircraft, the MiG-21, which we have large numbers, this has been designed as an, it can go to high altitude, intercept the uh, aircraft coming at a high altitude to bomb you, to do all that. Okay, that is there. And the MiG-31 is one of the very, very famous uh, uh, Russian aircraft. And the Tornado is one of the old uh, European aircraft. These are the fighters, okay? Now, let us see the other one. Then electronic warfare aircraft. Today, more and more <coughs> ground forces, ground radars, they are the fellow, the ground radars are the one who are tracking aircraft coming from outside, <coughs> okay? They are tracking. If I can disable this ground radar, then you, they can't track you. If you, that is a very, very critical function which needs to be done. So this fellow, what he does, the electronic warfare aircraft, that fellow will jam the ground system. And once it is jammed, you like a blind person, you are sitting there, you can't do anything. You are blind, if your radar is blinded. So that is the type, it's a highly specialized kind of aircraft. And another bigger fellow, which is placing, is called airborne early warning and control systems. These aircraft are airborne radar systems, you to detect enemy aircraft and ships at a long distance, something like 300 kilometers away, 400 kilometers, you are there able to, because they are at a very high height, something like 40,000 feet altitude. So you can see the amount of distance, you can see that. They also control and coordinate air operation. That fellow is like a, a, a command center up and above. Okay, from there they can control the whole area. They can even control the operations, uh, uh, tactics and all that kind of thing they can do. Um, they have a very important thing, uh, our identification friend or foe. What happens, there are fighters, they all look alike, they are from a distance. How do you know that fighter is a friend or a, a foe? Okay? So they have these, uh, they are another type of radars who will be able to send a message 
and if the message comes back in the way you are thinking, then he is a friend. If it is not so, that means he is an enemy. Okay? Then you can shoot him. <laughs> that is the point. They are operated at a very high altitude for a long period. They can operate for 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours. Like that, they can stay there. Okay? That is the thing. <clears throat> E3, very famous one. This is fitted on Illu and B Illusion 76 is what India also has got. Some new early warning aircrafts are being developed in India and they are getting operational. <clears throat> then of course transport aircraft, you all know that you need to take troops, you need to take uh, supplies, you need to carry tanks, you have to carry guns, you have to carry all these things. You need a transport. But also a transport aircraft is modified to be a tanker, a flying fuel tanker. So a fighter aircraft, you know, they are all, they can't endure for too long. A tanker goes, refuels it and thereby you continue the operation, okay. So it is an important role it is playing. And also, as I was mentioning to you, as India has done in the uh, erstwhile East Pakistan, uh, they, uh, they carry the bombs and they dump them <laughs> on the enemy, enemy territory uh, when there is no opposition, okay. That is what also people have been using. <coughs> Now you have multi-role combat aircraft. The thing is, I talked about uh, air superiority fighter, I talked about attack aircraft, I talked about uh, interceptor aircraft and all. Initially, they were all different types of aircraft. There are an attack aircraft is different, the interceptor is different, and a combat aircraft different and all. So wide varieties of aircrafts were being developed and all. Then came the concept of what you call a multi-role aircraft whereby it is doing a, a, what you call a ground attack and suddenly he finds an enemy aircraft coming, he can convert himself from a ground attack into a, a air, to air, air superiority fighter. That is what they call as capital swing, switching roles according to mission requirement. Same aircraft while flying, it can switch from one role to other. That is the important. The swing role ability, able to quickly switch roles between air to combat or air to ground strike role in the same mission is what made these aircraft very versatile. Hence, these aircraft the most used aircraft in any air force in the world. Currently serving are the F-16, F-18, MiG-29, Sukhoi-30, Rafale, Sabjad, Gripen and LCA Tejas. These are all multi-role aircraft. We can fly as an air superiority fighter. I fly as an attack aircraft, that is the kind of what you call benefit they have done. So these are now becoming more and popular and slowly they are replacing the old generation aircraft, okay. Now of course trainer aircraft, I do not have to explain. If you want to fly, fly an aircraft, you must first get trained. So these are very crucial things, okay. Now let us look at the slide to say how the fighters have evolved over periods, okay. Normally, we, you must be hearing about fourth generation fighter, fifth generation fighter, sixth generation fighter. What are they? The first generation, these are all post World War II. All the generation names have come post World War II. Okay? First is the jet propulsion. Just at the, um, somewhere toward the end of the uh, World War II, jet propulsion started. Okay? There was one uh, uh, Messerschmitt 262 and F 80, the uh, American, they were the first uh, fighters. They have been designed with a propulsion or jet propulsion. They are, they are subsonic aircraft, lower speeds, okay, but higher than the other ones. Then came generation two, they have swept wings. So, range only radar, the radar is able to detect the range only, infrared missiles, okay. Then the famous among these are the MiG 15 and F 86. MiG, in fact, in the Vietnam War, these aircrafts were used in Vietnam War. Initially F-16 was not there, they had F-104 and all that. So the MiG-15 was able to maneuver, were able to fight, to combat and all so much so, the Americans have lost their aircraft heavily. Then they brought this F-86, then it became parity, okay, that is what, this is Gen-3 Gen supersonic. Saber jets. Saber jet, F-86 is the Saber jet, that is the thing. Supersonic speed, pulse radar, able to shoot a target beyond visual range, they call the Century Series, F-105, F-14, F they are all the kind. These are all supersonic fighters, okay, these are all supersonic fighters. India tried to build an aircraft of generation 3, what we call as a HF-24, but basically it was a generation 2 aircraft, then Gen 2 aircraft only. Then came generation 4. This is pulse Doppler radar. High maneuverability. Yeah, Look. So there are questions. Uh, ah. What is 
pulse Doppler, see you know Doppler you know principle of Doppler, they send pulses <coughs> and then they will be able to detect uh, position and the speed of the other aircraft, okay. That is what the pulse Doppler concept is. They will be able to know even the size of the aircraft, type of the aircraft, the speed of the aircraft and the location of the aircraft. Important thing is you should know the speed and location thereby you would be able to know how much time is available before he reaches you or you have to reach him, okay. Now, this is a crucial fellow. Previously only a ranger only a rider that means I only know the distance but that is not I do not know at what speed is coming and what direction is coming where pulse Doppler will tell me that kind of a thing. So, it is a crucial thing, okay that is the point. <coughs> Then, uh, then what happened generation, these are the aircraft you know, we have, uh, all of you heard F-15, F-16, Mirage 2, India has got, Big 29 also India has got that one. Then generation 4 plus, this is uh, high agility, sensor fusion, reduced signatures, these are the kind of aircraft which are there. Then generation 4 plus plus, it is active electron L LCA comes to this generation 4 plus, okay. Then generation 4 plus plus is what you call as electronically scanned. The radars all up to now, they are mechanically, the radar antenna is being scanned <coughs> mechanically. Now, they change it from mechanical to electronic scan. The uh, antenna is staying there, but you know the phase change is occurring, okay. It is a very, very, very important thing, very, very important. That is what happens here. Gen 5 is where stealth is the key thing, where the high stealth, okay. There are only two aircraft which are there in the world, F-22 and F-35. This is a Gen 5. Then Gen 6 is not there anywhere, okay. What you call as the future is only thinking, uh, speculation, extreme stealth, efficient in all flight regimes, possible morphing capability, smart skins, highly networked, extremely sensitive sensors, operation optionally manned. That means so far I am talking about manned fighters. Now they are talking about fighters who normally are unmanned. But if required, uh, fellow can be pushed in, okay, that is the thing. So, there, that means there is a shift that is occurring now from manned to unmanned, okay. Let us see what is that. This is the expanding role of unmanned air vehicles. <coughs> While manned aircrafts have played decisive role in the Kant of war, there is a definite shift to unmanned aircraft today. Unmanned air vehicles have experienced exponential growth in recent history all over the world dull, dirty and dangerous missions are most suitable for UAVs. They are mostly dangerous because you put a man inside and he shot, aircraft is shot and he lands in enemy territory, uh, he is caught and you know what all the political implications and all. So, such missions now whether it is in Afghanistan or Iraq and all, USA is now primarily is using only unmanned vehicles for bombing and all that kind of a thing. This advantage is the size of the aircraft is not constrained by life support element and size of the person. You are, this is advanced and also the size is coming down. Even a soldier can carry a microwave vehicle and he can launch it. Very small weapons, very small missiles, very small weapons and he can do it. It is like a backpack you are carrying, you have a backpack aircraft <laughs> to that level or you have an aircraft which can stay in the air for days. Because if there is no man, nothing to worry, you do not have to go to toilet, <laughs> nothing is required, it is a toilet free, <laughs> food free, toilet free, everything because that fellow you can do it on the ground, okay. That is the great advantage you have. So, slowly you can see that there is a change there that is occurring. Now, lots of different varieties of unmanned air vehicles are now coming. We have tactical aircraft, short range, they are operational. I think India has one aircraft called Nishant. It's about four hours of operation, primarily reconnaissance and all that, surveillance, reconnaissance, it does that. Then you have a medium range. We, uh, they have got an aircraft called Rustam 1 in uh, advanced stage of development, okay. It's about eight to ten hours of uh, flying and all in that. There's an aircraft called male. It's not male, female. <laughs> male is medium altitude to long endurance vehicle. And there's an aircraft called Rustam 2. And this is the one what you call that uh, US is using that kind of aircraft, um, go for 24 hours and all that. That is, uh, uh, so that, that is the fellow what you done. There are a lot of mini, I am sure in, in IIT everywhere, there are a lot of mini aircraft are there. Lot of them have been developed, a lot of them are being used. And there are some vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, helicopters, or you have quadrocopter and all that kind of, but extensively they are not being used. 
by not only military, by paramilitary, by police force, for civil applications, all of them. Last week I was discussing with a doctor in Chennai, he wants uh, some critical organs, um, what you call, to be transported from one place to other place within few minutes. So a quadrupacter is the, so you are designing a quadrupacter where the payload is in an air conditioned, cooled environment kept there and can come within 10 minutes and from one hospital to the next hospital and then is available there. Today that is what, the postal and all is nice gimmicks, but uh, carrying critical organs is a critical thing. So that is one kind of work of friends <coughs> in IIT Madras and the doctors there, they are working on that. <coughs> so strike aircraft, that is what I mentioned, they are able to carry weapons and targets. Now uh, surface to air, uh, the army or the navy, all of them have to learn how to, uh, what you call, uh, home their missiles, how to home their guns, how to, so you need a target fellow, okay, and uh, you do target practice on that. So these are the targets which are used. We have some in India for that. So, and micro air vehicles, very small, I told backpack you can carry. These are our micro air vehicles, okay. They are then nano, much smaller, 300 grams, small size, okay. Another very important I thought I must mention to you is called unmanned combat air vehicle. There is no man there, but they can do combat and they can fight a war, they can drop weapons, nowhere in the world it is available, but lot of countries are working, including India, okay. You are trying to develop an unmanned fighter as a successor to LC and all, we are working in that kind. It's a very, very important technology and uh, there are also law, high altitude, long endurance vehicles, like one week you want the aircraft to stay, unmanned air vehicle, solar powered, okay, with the battery, solar powered and all. Lot of work is going on. Again, there is nothing operational yet, but hell of a lot of work is going on all over the world. So you can see there is a range of aircraft, unmanned air vehicles are coming up. So um, the prediction is in ten, next 10 years, maybe 50 percent of the fighting forces will be unmanned. So that is the kind of uh, things it is. So if you see that, so if you see, mm. in your previous slide, there is one column called BLOS. Uh, beyond line of sight. See, line of sight is what I can see. Beyond line of sight is beyond what I see. That means you have a short range missile, I can see. Gun, I can see. But uh, long range missile is there, is beyond line of sight. That is what is there. Beyond line of sight, missiles are bigger. Small vehicles cannot carry, but big ones can do that. that is. So, you find, this gives an idea about operational one, payload capability in pounds and endurance. A very, very small one, mini fellows are here. There is one Indian eagle, pushpak and all those things are there. I think pushpak is the one, I think Pona Pharma or so, they have done that. Indian eagle is done by NAL and all those kind of things here. There is a second bigger, what you call, higher endurance, higher payload. There are two vehicles, Nishant and Rustam one, okay. Both are developed by ADE, they are there. Then still higher levels, you have Rustam two, these are the kind. They are all operational fellows, this is under development. But there is still big, like global hawk you are talking, their endurance levels is much higher. Much, much. We do not have anything near that. There is a need to develop something in that direction, okay. This is a area to look at. <coughs> oh, one important uh, technology critical for war fighting is what you call get connected, share information, achieve net centric operations. No warrior fights now alone. Earlier, uh, Brav Bravado, he is a skilled fellow, he fought a one to one fighting and all. Now, whole system, every fighter aircraft, every ground center, every unmanned air vehicle, every helicopter, all are interconnected with each other. With, uh, I will show you what you call uh, airborne early warning system, okay. They are all interconnected so that information flow is available to all the people and the decision is taken with knowledge and information available. But the problem there is net is now under attack. <laughs> you have a cyber security problem. How do you develop what you call the software with the security element added to it? And the moment I make it highly secure, the bandwidth increases, okay. You have seen sometimes your radio control for small noise, what you call say interference come, that fellow is out. Imagine you are fighting a war. This is a major problem in this net centricity. And second thing is, Army, Air Force, Navy, they all have developed over hundreds of years. Each uh, works in isolation from the other. How to make them work together? 
It's a channel, not in India, anywhere in the world. So that is a channel. But this seems to be the only way you can win a war. Okay. <clears throat> so what it means is we are talking of integrated, interoperable between platforms, joint operations, collision forces, worldwide networks, secure, owned and leased, operational locations could be anywhere. This is the kind of a scenario what you are talking. So this is what is the future that we are working on. <clears throat> now, having given this introduction, <laughs> let me now tell you what are this. What? How do you uh, secure during the uh, joint missions? Like you are doing the practice, joint practice missions. That is where the secure codes are there. The whole, all your codes are now. We have a uh, security embedded into it, and only other side when he knows what all the sig uh, what you call the codes, he only will be able to operate. Otherwise. Or he has to learn how to unscramble, what you call scrambling and unscrambling, you know. Whenever there is a message, I scramble first. That means I made, uh, recorded it. The other side, he has the way to unscramble it and uh, read it. The scrambling and unscrambling, that is what is the kind of a technology you have to bring in, okay. Uh, joint missions, like the entire uh, That is what they do, uh, just about uh, in uh, near real time, this, uh, uh, this goes through all the friendly forces. So they have now that uh, code. Okay, with that they will be able to unscramble the message. So this is another major problem. Okay, <laughs> it is a good question. Eh? That means I have no good answer for it. Okay, this is how the real. Suppose the other fellow has learned your uh, 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 code for unscrambling, you have lost it. Okay, this is the problem. While net centricity is such a wonderful thing, but how do you, uh, that is why some air forces or some armies and all, they are a little bit worried about how this will be, protect the secrecy of that codes, okay, that is the problem. <coughs> now, let us look at now the requirements, what are the kind of things we are talking about? You see now, under what conditions the fighting is going to take place? See what you call developed scenarios, military goals, what are the targets, what are the threats, what are the air bases and what is the environment? All this you should know. You have to, so that means military intelligence is an extremely important part of a, your war. Okay? Then you develop scenarios, not only today's intelligence, you have to now extrapolate for next 10 years, 15 years, what is going to be the kind of them, including that uh, adversary's industrial capability, technological capability, what uh, supplier capability, where he is getting, what he is doing, that is the kind of scenarios you have to develop. Then formulate system concepts from the preliminary requirement. Then what you do, you do a desired system character, conceptual design and aircraft sizing. If you have to have this kind of scenario, what kind of aircraft, what kind of weapon system it is, you do an aircraft sizing. Then you do what you call, if I have this kind of a baseline aircraft, what is the effectiveness it is there? an effectiveness analysis has to be done. Am I now having certain edge over the adversary or not? It is an effective analysis. Then with that, it is an iteration you do. Then you come to a, a stage where you say, if this is the next 15 years, the adversary is going to have this capability. The fighter force I am now going to build should have this kind of edge over him. Okay, this is the kind of thing what we are talking. So normally I said a multi-role you have air to air, air to ground and air to sea. <clears throat> so one of the oldest things you have heard, you have seen, you have must have seen a lot of movies is called a close combat where two fighters are fighting with each other. They call dog fight because it is like two dogs <laughs> fighting with each other, very close range, seeing each other's face and uh, happening <coughs> maybe something like four to five kilometers. Beyond that they can't see each other. Okay, within three nautical miles, what we call it. So that is the kind of thing. In fact, this is the trace of one such thing. Okay, this is how olden days, Second World War, after Second World War, during Vietnam War, Korean War, and all that. This and 1965 war of uh, India and uh, uh, Pakistan. This is what the dog fights were very common things. We had one uh, very wonderful small aircraft called NAT, and they had an aircraft called F-86. Okay, there used to be war. NAT is a very small aircraft. Other fellow can't see this fellow, okay? And if you want to get into a NAT uh, as a, a fighter pilot, you have to first reduce your weight, size, height, so that you can go inside. 
This is a very, very small aircraft, okay? And uh, what was uh, that F-16 was a big fellow, okay? <laughs> Mota, Ustade. So this fellow, before that fellow seen this fellow, this fellow used to shoot him. <laughs> so there used to be uh, tremendous victories uh, in such a scenarios. Then um, these are the kind of things that uh, aircraft do, combat air patrol. You are patrolling that area as a fighter to see for any enemy fellow is coming. If you are coming, now you engage him into war, or into a fire, combat. Then beyond visual range combat, that's what I was telling. You have what you call a radar, a pulse Doppler radar, that was the question, whereby you are able to see from a long distance, 100 kilometers away, fighters normally about 100 kilometers, you are able to see him, able to see the speed, see the direction, and roughly you are able to identify the type of aircraft. Once you are able to identify what type of aircraft, you know what weapons it can carry and all, and then if you have a beyond visual range uh, missile, I, my missile will lock on to him and I deliver the missile. Same thing adversary will do, okay. The question is a question of few seconds. That may be two to three seconds. If you have that two seconds, you are able to see him earlier, he is out. Otherwise, you go up. <laughs> that is what will happen, okay. That fighter, fighter escort, hmm, there are some bombers who are going down or a fighter is going to bombing. Uh, as a combat aircraft, you are giving an escort so that nobody will attack him because with all bombs and all his maneuverability is very low. He can't fight, he can't move. So you need a fellow to protect him and move forward and that is what they do, okay. Uh, interception is an area where aircraft is, uh, the olden days they used to come at high altitude, even now they come at high altitude, stealth aircraft and all. Let us say you are able to detect him, you go at a high altitude, intercept him before he enters into your territory. Before he enters into your territory, you intercept him, prevent him enter into your territory, destroy him in his own territory. That is what happens, okay. Um, I have talked about close support, introduction I have already talked. Deep strike is what I said, will go deep into enemy territory, destroy his critical supply positions, critical manufacturing plan. Let us say he is manufacturing aircraft. If I destroy that plant, then he can't do anything, okay. That is what it happens, okay. So this is the kind of a scenario what we are talking about. Here is what you call battle area and uh, you have air strike, the enemy aircrafts are coming, you have air based defense, our aircraft are trying to defend, prevent them to enter into air. There you have combat air patrols, they are patrolling the whole area, okay. You have close support aircraft supporting our tanks and all. Similarly, that fellow also is trying to do that. It's a question of who has an edge over the other. It's a combination of weapons and tactics, it's a combination, okay, that's what happens. So typically air super mission, you take off, climb, you do a subsonic cruise flight, descend, what happens when the aircraft to descend down because there is a ground is a big camouflage, not only visually, but there is a lot of what you call radar noise. So the signal gets uh, uh, camouflaged inside the noise of the ground, uh, so that enemy radar is unable to detect you. Then you go into it, okay. But once you are bombed at very low speed and once you enter into enemy territory, you increase your uh, height, reduce your speed, you throw all your bombs and all, have some uh, combat, then come back and do that. If you are lucky, you are back here, okay. If you are not lucky, your adversary is lucky, you do not leave another day to fight, okay. That is the point. <clears throat> now, what are the characteristics that you need for such a multi role fight? Performance requirements. Mission profiles, maneuverability and agility, landing and takeoff distances. These are the crucial, your man, agility and man, maneuverability and mission. You must be able to carry weapons, have to radar, have to carry fuel and you should be able to go long distances and observables, radar, IR signatures, avionics functions, we have a, a internal avionics for jammers, radar supplies and a pilot must have a display, all that information should come to him then you must be able to sustain. If the aircraft it should be having as minimum failures as possible. If you have too many failures, your aircraft is on the ground and that is trying to what you call, you are busy in re repairing and maintaining, okay. And uh, time taken to repair also should be like what you are talking even for a transport aircraft. If the time taken for repair is too long, aircraft on ground is as good as not having them. That is what you use the word call availability, okay. That is there. Of course, cost should be low cost so that you are able to handle this. <clears throat> so 
So, what is the kind of thing that you know? let us look at the threat? I talked about enemy, adversary, threat, uh, and all. What are those threats? Let us look at that. <coughs> the threat to aircraft have been defined as those elements of man made environment designed to reduce the ability of an aircraft to perform mission related functions. What are they? Inflicting damaging effects, forcing undesirable maneuvers, or degrading system effectiveness. Anyway, I have a radar, he has not killed me, but my radar has become ineffective. I have become a blind fellow flying the aircraft. It is of no use. So, uh, my system effectiveness got degraded. I uh, forcing undesirable. He will push you so that you make a tight maneuver. You are all uh, aircraft uh, uh, people. If you go into a, um, you cross the stall regime, uh, you lose control. Is it not? You lose control. So, he will force you to do that. Then also you are out. And of course, damage a gun or a missile, five seconds to you, you are out. Okay? You can't, no more you can fight. At most you can escape and run away. Okay? That is the kind of thing. What is it that you use? Okay? There are three. <laughs> what are they? One is types of what you call threats are what you call non-terminal and terminal. What are non-terminal threat? Detection, that fellow is able to detect you. Identification, he is identifying you. Tracking you and communications. He is tracking you and he is communicating to his uh, what you call friendly forces that uh, this is your characteristics, these are your things, will there. So, this is also a threat. Okay? And second is terminal, propagator and platform, projectiles, missiles, radiation. Okay? And platforms are guns, surface launchers, airborne interceptor, we have discussed so forth and direct energy devices. We will talk a little bit of each one of them. Okay? If you look at this uh, projectiles, we are talking about small arms. Uh, Anti-aircraft uh, 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 systems, missiles are surface to air missiles, air to air missiles. Radiation is laser and EMP, electromagnetic pulse, electromagnetic pulse. The, 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 these are the I have already indicated, they are the kind of, these are the kind, it is not good enough you have an aircraft, it is not good enough you have an, uh, what you call a radar, you must have a weapon, okay, and what type of weapon you can carry, these are the kind of things which are important. <coughs> Now, I, we talked about terminal and non, uh, what you call, non-terminal threats we said detection, early warning, target identification, target tracking, electronic counter countermeasures. If uh, he is trying to uh, what you call jam my radar, how electrons will jam his radar. So, it is uh, depends upon which fellow is better than the other fellow. That is where technology comes. Okay? Okay. If mine is a next generation fellow, he is drowned. I am uh, one up. Okay, that's right. Then fire of weapon controls. Then communication system. They can be land, sea, or air base. It can be any one of them. Um, the terminals have already talked. So, what are the kind of things? We have different types of guns: small arms, ACAG guns. You have seen all our movies. You know when the aircraft can surface to air guns or our ACAG guns. We use quite a bit. Okay. Then you have guided missiles. Okay, lot of missiles, surface to air missiles, air to air missiles, both of them. <coughs> so, typically if you see that you have different types of what you call surface to ground weapons, weapon carriers and all. So, and there are different types of guidance systems. Even a kind of guidance is also important for surface to air. What are the guidance we are talking? It is called command guidance. Okay, there is a command and the missile takes the command and follows that. Second fellow, we call it as single beam rider missile. There is a beam. The missile will ride over the beam. It does not have its own capabilities. If the beam is pointing towards a threat, an aircraft and all, this missile will ride over that and hit it. Okay? Uh, if I am uh, putting a laser beam, a laser guided missile will go and hit that one. Uh, so others are all what you call autonomous. They have all of their own. Okay? Active homing, semi-active homing, passive homing. There are large number of these. These missiles have totally changed the whole scenario about the threat. Threat is totally changed. And that is where I think the Russians have done a lot. These are some of the pictures of what you call land based things. Yeah, I want you to see this fellow. There are various types of surface to air missiles. There is a zone of effectiveness as a function of altitude. It is interesting for you to say if I have only these type of missiles with, let us say I have got only a gun. It's, uh, they, they, it can go only up to this much altitude, 15,000 feet also, it can't go beyond that. If I have surface to air, metal, SA-6, they are all Russian types and all, 
they can go right up to something like 35,000 feet altitude and 40,000 feet altitude. If you have SF-4 missile, it can go right up to this altitude. That means if I have all these missiles up to this height, enemy cannot enter easily without encountering this fellow. So what people you were doing, the reconnaissance aircraft like SR-71, U-2 and all, they were flying at 100,000 feet altitude about this 90,000 fellow. So even though you have missiles, you know that fellow is going, you can do nothing. He is happily photographing you, taking all that thing, so reconnaissance and running away. That was the thing. So initially they had manned fighter like her. Afterwards they changed it to unmanned, you too. Okay, very famous fellow. That is what they are still being done. Although the world is still being done, you know they are all flying, but you can't do anything. So that is the benefit you have if you have such very high altitude things. Okay? So I mentioned to you this uh, the three types, so what you call surface air missiles, you have damage mechanism is here. I do not want to go too deep into it. Damage processes, how is the damage process? Combustion, penetration, ballistic impact, hydraulic ram, dynamic loading and just over pressure. I generate so much pressure, the whole thing will explode. I just go in and generate the pressure. So, so it goes inside your cockpit into a tank, the whole fuel tank, it will explode because the pressure, there is nothing else there. Just he generates huge pressure. So this is the kind of things what they do. Okay? Now, <coughs> there is... Question. Uh, what kind of mobile are we developing for air-to-air? -air? It is called, um, uh, what you call, um, uh, short range and beyond visual range, Astra is the missile first time we are developing a air to air missile called Astra. Um, this missile is a beyond the visual range missile, has something like about 50 kilometers of a range okay? uh, and a uh, lot of trials have been done, seems to be doing quite well. But you know any missile, any aircraft, you need a huge amount of testing before it becomes ready, okay? but that is the thing. So far our attempt has been surface to air missiles, but now air to air missile development is going on. That is the Astra one. Then. Do we have dedicated test planes and test planes? Test planes, yeah, we have. We have. There, there is one organization called AST uh, in Bangalore. Uh, they, uh, it's a dedicated place for testing all aircraft. Okay, they are the people. Missile who, developing agency. Missile is done by the missile development group itself. They have one place in on the coast of uh, Orissa. Okay, they have the very very advanced test facilities. All our Astra things. Has to be tested from Sukhoi or something like that. Some that then they use that facility because they have tracking facilities, instrumentation, right? It's called an instrumented range. Then you fire against. That is where what you call targets. You are a target. It's like another aircraft, but it's unmanned one. That fellow is flying, and from surface to you have a air-to-air -air missile on a Sukhoi or a Mirage 2 or an LCA. You fire that one, and you see how effective it is because that uh, target. Uh, is instrumented, this fellow is instrumented, the range is instrumented, okay? totally all three dimensional you are uh, instrumented the whole thing and that is the reason why they do that, okay? that is the location and it is a vast sea, you are able to do this because it is a vast sea there. Okay? Mm. And sir, uh, how do you know if an enemy is actually entering into your territory? That is what you call, uh, uh, you know there is an aircraft entering in. That is, I have mentioned to you, there is an equipment called IFF, in, uh, identification friend or foe. So, uh, your own aircraft have this equipment. So, they will have the code. The code will continuously will be changing, but at that at any instant you will have the code. So, you will send a message to that aircraft and that fellow is to be, uh, what you call, uh, returns the message with some code data, you know he is a friend. Then you do not shoot him. You said interceptor has to intercept a vehicle in the enemy's territory, right? Even then, uh, enemy territory also, suppose you have four interceptors from our side are going, uh, you may be seeing the radar, not only his aircraft, your own aircraft also. Okay, there are four. It is not one aircraft normally does not go. Minimum of two, sometimes four. So, then your radar sees all aircraft. Radar does not know his enemy or friend. Okay? So, this IFF is the one which will tell you his enemy or friend. Now, how do we know if he is actually coming with an intention to... That is what, if he re responds in a positive way to my message, that means he has no negative uh, thing. We have, we have an active radar, which is 
scan. No, no, his question is suppose it is a transport aircraft or something like that. No. Uh. Let us say I have like Pakistan India border. So, they might be doing some kind of practice maneuver, but close to the. No, if he is doing a practice maneuver, there is an understanding they will say we are doing a friendly, uh, we are doing our own things, we are not. See, you also see in which direction is coming. And you also know we are in a state of war or peace. So, all these are information. <laughs> okay, that is right. Okay. But sometimes we make mistakes. Recently, Ukraine versus Russia, I have a feeling our, the Russian or supported forces have you know, fired a missile against a Malaysian aircraft. It is a mistake. You have lost. So, mistakes do happen. You have various uh, what you call systems and processes, but sometimes mistakes do happen, and that's how you have lost that. It is a pakka is a case a case of uh, because why should uh, these fellows should destroy a Malaysian aircraft, a passenger aircraft is two hundred or something like passengers and all. It's a mistake that has occurred. It does happen. Okay. 